Hi everybody, Mike Bellevue here. Uh, I just wanted to let you know this is going to be part one of a two-part series. Uh, it didn't start out that way, but that's, uh, that's what it's going to take. So I hope you enjoy it. Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today we're back out at Duelist Den. And I've got a treat for you. Certainly it's going to be a treat for me. I hope it is for you too. Usually we shoot reproduction uh, reproductions of antique guns here, but today we're going to be shooting the real deal. This is an original 1860 Colt 44 caliber Army revolver. This particular gun was built in 1864, and we're going to put it through its paces today. Now, whenever I shoot one of my original guns, and I do have a number of them, uh, I always get comments saying, oh for shame. You shouldn't subject a piece of history to that kind of abuse. There are replicas for that, blah, 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 blah. And I get it, but, uh, but I'm gonna tell you, these guns were well built and they were made to be shot. And if they're in good shape today, they will work as well as they did 150 years ago, right? I mean, this one's 156 years old and I expect it to do just fine. This will be my first time shooting it, but it's not gonna blow up. Uh, so if you get a gun checked out and it's sound, mechanically sound, it should be fine to shoot. Now I wouldn't use this in a cowboy action shooting match, I wouldn't subject it to that kind of abuse, but for occasional shooting it should do just wonderful. And you know this is a gun that was not left in a, uh, a sock drawer and never used. This is a gun that in its lifetime saw use. It was shot, and it was shot a lot, uh, particularly early in its life. And I can tell by the kinds of wear patterns that it has on the action parts. Now, this is a gun that I postulate, I don't know for sure, but I postulate that this gun was uh, owned by someone, and he didn't throw it over when those newfangled metallic cartridge guns came out. He was obviously comfortable with this technology, and I think he kept using it all his life. So this is a gun that got put through its paces, and for most of its life it was pretty well treated. Now it looks to me like probably in the 30s and 40s that changed a bit, and I think it, it was not treated as well. And, and my guess is that the owner died, original owner, uh, grandchildren maybe inherited this, and maybe they just didn't understand black powder the way somebody who grew up with it did. And I think they, uh, they did not keep it as clean as it should have been. So after a long time of running well, I think this went through a bad stage. And I think that the barrel on this ultimately got ruined. And uh, when I came across this gun, it had some issues. And, and I'll tell you about those. Well, when I first came across this 1860 Army revolver at an online uh, gun store website, one I've done quite a bit of business with in the past, they were obviously very enamored with it. I mean, they had a, a price on it that, um, that would have befitted a pristine example of an 1860 Army revolver. Um, but this was pretty far from pristine at the time. So, it had some issues that were apparent to me, even just looking at the pictures online. It had a problem with the loading lever. I'll, I'll try to show you that in a minute. And the barrel assembly had a big barrel cylinder gap and it was a little bit rocky in its made up. It was not, uh, not really that pleased with it. So I knew it had a problem with the barrel. And I knew it had a problem with the loading lever. And I assumed if it had that, it might have some other problems too. So, and it's got a lot of wear. You can see over here, we've got, you know, quite a bit of grip wear. So I contacted the website and I told them that listing this as NRA good condition was probably not, not really kosher. And I explained why. And I, I told them the price that I would be willing to pay. And they basically told me to <laughs> go procreate with myself that they were going to get their price. So I said, okay. So two weeks later, they had it marked down basically to my price. So uh, 
And I got a hold of them and said I'd be willing to buy it. We negotiated a price. So I ended up getting this for about 40% of what they originally had it listed as. And I knew it was going to need some work. So the nipples were frozen. Uh, they were corroded in pretty badly. Had that problem with the barrel, and I had that loading lever that I knew was going to need to be replaced. So I sent it off to Lodgewood Manufacturing, Dave Stablo, uh, who's done work on uh, my Lamat replicas, but he does a lot of work on originals, and, and he does museum-quality restorations. So I told him what was up, what I thought was wrong, and, you know, have him take a look at it. So, easy stuff. He, uh, he has Colt parts made to Colt specs, okay? So he had a loading lever made to exactly Colt specifications, which the reproductions do not fit exactly right on a real Colt. So I got a new loading lever. I have the original still. And then there was the issue of the barrel. Now, when I bought this, one of the reasons why that gun store had such a high price on it is because it's all matching parts. And... Uh, and I thought that was correct at the time, but as it turns out, this barrel was not the original barrel for the gun. And uh, that's why I think probably in the 30s or 40s it did not get cleaned properly and it corroded beyond use. So, somebody, probably in the 1950s, took an earlier manufacturer Colt 1860 Army Barrel, because it's a genuine Colt Army Barrel, and they stuck it on there. What they did is they filed the serial number off. And back in the 50s, counterfeit Colt uh, dies, stamping dies, were making the rounds of, of gun fakers. So it was pretty easy to buy them. So they restamped this part with the same serial numbers as the rest of the gun. And uh, Dave could tell that because he could still see file marks around the serial numbers. And he could tell from the dimensions of the barrel that it was a little bit earlier manufacturer than this 1864 gun. So, what Dave did is he refit the barrel. And it, it now is excellent. So, it's not actually the matching barrel to this gun. That's okay. It's a genuine 1860 barrel. And I have a replacement part for the loading lever. But I've got the original as well. So... I pretty much brought this gun almost up. Uh, and actually, I brought it up to the originally advertised value, uh, but it's still nowhere near the, say, $2,500 that a, uh, a really good condition Colt would bring. But it's worth quite a bit more than I paid for it, uh, including the cost of the uh, repairs. So, so Dave at uh, Lodgewood Manufacturing, he's your guy for this kind of work. And I'm very happy with what he did. Okay, let's get, uh, let's get the 1860 loaded. I'm going to start off by loading it with paper cartridges, just like these. And this is one that I made myself. And I used this cartridge former set to do it. And this is made by Cap'n Ball, Cap'nBall.com. Uh, he's a Hungarian gent. His name is Balzath Nemeth. And he is the host of the Cap and Ball channel on YouTube. Probably the best black powder channel on YouTube. And, and I say that better than my channel, i got to say. So he made this, customized it for me. Um, and you can order them from him. I'll put the link down below. He also sells this packaging. And, and this is kind of cool. So this is a lot like what you would have seen in the day. It would have looked like this. And inside would be uh, six cartridges, right? So you can get the whole bit. And these will fit in your Civil War cartridge uh, box. And it'll be just cool. Now, this is what they really looked like back in the day. I've got a friend named John Gurney. Who makes museum quality uh, cartridges and, and packaging. And if I rip this open, it would be a, a smaller wooden container with six cartridges and six percussion caps. So I'm going to keep this together because uh, I'll use up the cartridges I make and keep this for display. But this is what they would look like. You just pull this wire and it would rip the paper open and you're able to pull out the cartridges, load them, put the caps on, you're good. 
I, I get questioned a lot as to whether or not people used cartridges more than they used, uh, you know, loose, loose ball and powder. And certainly for the military, for the military, they absolutely used cartridges more. They came into their own, the cartridges did, right at the beginning of the Civil War, just before the Civil War. And the Army decided that logistically, it was much easier to provide these made-up cartridges, even though they're expensive, than it was to provide loose powder and ball and, and percussion caps. So, it really makes sense because you wouldn't want a whole bunch of bullets showing up, balls showing up, and have no powder or vice versa, right? Uh, people didn't want to carry around a pound of powder with them, you know, and a knapsack full of balls. I mean, it's much easier to throw two of these in your belt pouch and go about your business. So the Army would ship these in crates, you know, out, uh, out to the troops, and they were quite popular. Now, did civilians use round balls and loose powder more? I don't know. You know, it's, it's really hard to pin that down. Uh, I'm going to tell you, though, my guess is they probably continued to use these. And I know they're more expensive, but just look at today, right? I mean, today, you know, brass cartridges are pretty expensive. Uh, but most people do not reload. Why? Because it's kind of a pain in the butt. And most people don't shoot that much. And it was the same thing in the 19th century. I mean, somebody would have this gun to protect themselves from claim jumpers or other brands of idiots, right? But, uh, you know, they weren't out target shooting every day. And people that were probably did use loose powder and ball most of the time. But for most guys, they would go to the hardware store and pick up a couple of these and, uh, you know, maybe go through them every, every couple of months or every couple of years. So I think that, that most people would just have bought these rather than buying a, uh, a keg of powder and having to buy lead and mold up their own balls. I mean, it's not like today where you can go out and buy a box of Hornady balls or something. So, did people use cartridges back in the day? I think they did. Uh, I think they did quite a bit. So, let's, let's see how this goes with cartridges. We'll just load it up. So, just like all of these guns, I'm going to put on half cock. So the cylinder turns. I've already loaded a couple of these in. Now, the beauty of this, this cartridge drops in, right? And you can see how much room there is to do that. Now, on, on reproduction guns, Uberties and Piettas. Whoop, there we go. And in it goes. That's all you do. I'm going to load them all up. And we'll be all set. But on reproduction guns, one of the things that, uh, that you notice is that cartridges do not fit in until the gun's been modified to take them. Right? But on a genuine Colt, there's plenty of room for the bullet to go in. And that's the difference for some reason, the modern replicas are just not made to that same dimension. And I guess they figured people are not going to be shooting cartridges these days, so they don't care. But if you buy an original, you don't have to do any modification to it. And you can see it's got, uh, it's got that same work that I have to do with grinders on my Ubertis and Piettas to accept cartridges. Well, it just takes them. And in they go. All right, we'll just put one more in, and it's just no problem at all. Bang. So, we'll get this capped up, and then we'll see how it shoots. Well, I've got the Colt 1860 loaded up with paper cartridges. Got a target 15 yards away, so let's see where it prints on paper.
Okay, that's my first chain fire in about 35 years, I guess. <laughs> so, I gotta put another cap on this and shoot out one more chamber. We'll see how it does. Okay, well in part two, all will be revealed. And I'll, I'll tell you right now that it took me about a half hour to get this thing uh, fully shootable. And you'll see that next week. So, in the meantime, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. Uh, please subscribe. Enjoy our website, MikeBellaview.com. And I'll see you next week. Enjoy. Uh, well, I hope you enjoyed your Independence Day. It's before Independence Day for me. So catch you later.